Hello and welcome. It's Dr. David Fenton, and we're looking at this, the second in our series of online lectures in preparation for workshops for the Jude Actors and Directors Development Program. How we know we are focusing, however, on the preparatory work a director needs to do in their executive function. So let's move on. We're looking at research and analysis. Uh, we'll look at our process so far. We'll look at the things that we feel that need to be researched to understand the full context of the work. That is, if it's an extant work. In other words, an extant work being something that already exists as opposed to something that you're making. But something you're making would in, could potentially involve, and invariably does, a lot of research as well. Research tools. Analysis. Get, getting on the same page with you, and the reason why I'm, I'm doing this, and in some respects it could be gilding the lily, but I feel that we need to do a performance studies 101 definitions so that we're all talking the same language, not that I expect you to fully um, internalise those, um, those ideas that we're going to go through, but it's good for us to continue to try to speak the same language talk about the notion of dramatic action, talk about the dramatic question of the work, talk about the analytical tools that we could use, and once again, big questions, why theatre? So this is, um, it starts wide, it gets narrow, and then it gets wide again. Basically, that's the curve of this lecture. And then your homework. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm pushing the button here and I'm waiting for it to turn over, but it's not doing so. Um, this is the second time I've attempted to record this lecture. And it's just thinking, I think, so bear with me. Ah, there it is. Our process so far. So we've looked at philosophy and uh, we haven't had an opportunity to unpack that. And we will when we come together this weekend. Uh, we're looking at research and analysis here at the moment. We're looking at uncovering the context of the play for, for use of a, a more open term. We'll be moving through to conceptualization, which is how, how do I envisage what is the vision that I have for the work based upon the philosophy, the research and the analysis. And then finally, when we get together with the, re with the workshops, we'll try to synthesize these notions together in action. Everything in good time. You probably want to ask the classic question that most directors want to ask, which is how do I work with actors? Dear God, how do I work with them? Um, We'll be demonstrating that on the floor. We'll look at the tools, we'll look at lots of different techniques, blah, blah, blah. So please be patient with the fact that we need to do some groundwork beforehand. That's something I directed. Mm, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. There we go, with students. That was fun. Now I'm pushing the button again and it doesn't seem to want to click. Ah, oh, yeah, it's research. Well, why even research a play? Can't we just pick it up and deal with it with, on its own merits? Like we, we look at a painting and we deal with it on its own merits. However, great wealth of appreciation for that painting can kick in when we understand who painted it, why they painted it, where they painted it, what influences, what genre it particularly is. So you need to, as I said before, know more about the play than anyone else in your cohort of collaborators um, until opening night. And at that point, there's a lot of letting go. Um, there is maintenance of the work. But at that point, the actor really should know more than you know about the work because they're experiencing it in real time. Moving on. We need to research to understand the world of the play. And when I say the world of the play, every play has a world unto itself, even if that world is, um, in some respects, attempting to simulate reality or, or our contemporary reality or even our period understanding of that reality. Uh, world, plays have worlds unto their own because within those worlds, themes and concerns are addressed and explored. And it is the summation of those themes and concerns that assist in creating a specific world of the play. So when I say world of the play, I'm not talking about a location or a place. I'm talking about the dramatic 
world of the play, which includes the dramaturgy, which, as we know, is a process of looking at the, at the text structurally and uncovering its meaning. These are the things that we should be researching. We should be researching the playwright, and it's easy to research um, Michael Gow and Stephen Sewell. It's easy to locate these particular works in their oeuvre, in other words, their, the curve of their work, the body of their work. And both of these plays come at a very unusual time for these playwrights. Um, you've, you've had Stephen Sewell writing massive, epic, international, international pieces, and now he writes uh, a dense psychological work for two, two, two people. Why? What is he doing? What's the change? Um, and, of course, for those of you that know your theatre history, you'll know that Sweet Phoebe was a long time coming, um, particularly after having written Furious, and Furious was a response to how um, his uh, Michael's second play was responded to, which is 1876, I think that play is. Um, not a date, the actual name of the play. Um, Furious was an incredible play, still is and uh, was immensely dangerous with its themes. And then a time passes and Michael comes back to writing and we have Sweet Phoebe. Now, Sweet Phoebe is an exquisite little stylistic two-hander. Um, it operates with incredible universal themes. But the thing is there was a whole debate about it with regards to plagiarism. So that is a ghost that follows the work. Um, so... Their context, the playwright's context, what they're responding to in the work, what it was that they'd previous written and why it is that they departed or didn't depart from that is absolutely essential for you to understand. The text itself is something you have to understand. You have to dig in. You have to have the tools to be able to analyse it and pull it apart, not just as a director with a dramaturgical eye, but with the director with an eye to acting. Uh, what are the key points? Where is the dramatic action? How does this activate? Uh, what does it do to an audience and what is the story that it's telling? Uh, each play, each world uh, comes with a set of visual images and we know for well the, um, the symbolic language, I suppose, that's resonating through both of these work, what the dog represents and how the dog, Sweet Phoebe, represents um, a notion of, I don't want to go into that yet, but let's just say there's a visual imagery there and there's a steeped, dense visual imagery all the way through Michael's work. Um, yet there's also a very simple, um, childlike, um, melancholy um, and innocent image that literally floats, I suppose, uh, through the Sewell's work with sisters. So each each play conjures up a series of visual images and symbols, um, pictures, I suppose, and it's about finding a way to dramatise them in the space. Uh, and what I'm literally talking about here is the art of scenography, which is a totally different entry point into directing, which is all directing is a series of pictures. I am not a scenographer, and yet I have approached certain works in a scenographic way. But fundamentally, it's the text, the text at the centre that brings those images to life, as opposed to, I'm going to apply a series of images on top of this text in a perverse fashion in order to simply show off. Sound and music. Well, sound, every uh, a good playwright is always conjuring up the oral landscape and even the musical landscape of a work. Music can be embedded into the work as, a, as an absolute theatrical gesture that works on many symbolic levels. It can be dead central or it can be incidental. Um, sound, soundscape. Uh, what is the sound of both of these plays? What do you think about that? The core sound, invariably there's one sound that will ring or one piece of music that will ring true to the world of the play and you need to investigate that. You need to research that. Historical and cultural background. Well, okay, we're, 
what's interesting particularly about Sweet Phoebe is that, you know, Michael's writing that in the 90s and we're looking at, you know, the rise of yuppies and we're in, and what's interesting with that particular couple is it's obvious that they've gone through some type of couples counselling and they have rules, strict rules of engagement with regards to the health of their relationship. That's important. That's really important to understand what that is. Uh, would you set Sweet Phoebe as, or Sisters, as a contemporary piece? Or would you think that Sweet Phoebe sits better as a piece that sits in our last century in the 90s and sits best there? So the historical context of the work and the cultural background, the cultural background of the playwright is important as well, um, but the cultural background of the characters, where it's set, why it's set, these are two very, very different locations and they come with it um, two very different sets of characters that inhabit those locations that create a network of, of culture around them that are both very, very different. In what way are they and how can we research that? Fashion, these are, these are, these are important things. I saw um, Sweet Phoebe when it first opened at Sydney Theatre Company with Kate Blanchett in it and the austerity of the design said something and the notion of dressing and undressing and taking your entire wardrobe as a trail of crumbs and leaving it outside for people to pick up and go, oh, that's nice, I'll wear that. Um, it, it, all, of these are, all of these are important. Those props, those costume props that can be worn but also used as props, what fashion are they? Uh, you literally have to conceive of an entire wardrobe for that character. Interesting. History of theatre context. Well, I've already given you some history um, of theatre context with regards to both of those works, understanding where the, where the playwright is coming from in the previous work invariably tells you their point of departure for the next. But say if this was a period piece, and I'll be talking briefly about a period piece later on, um, two period pieces, the history of theatre at that time, what are the conventions that the audience understand? When I say conventions, I mean dramatic conventions or theatrical conventions. And when I say conventions, I mean rules. What are the rules of engagement with that particular audience at that particular time? Remember I was talking about the fact that there's no such thing as an Elizabethan audience anymore. History and context of the original work tells you what it is that you're departing from. And for some people, most importantly, it tells you what you're editing and not including. But And I don't have any concerns about that. I've contemporised work before because, once again, I sit as a liberal director, so relevance um, is paramount in everything that I do. I wouldn't put anything in period for the mere sake of putting it in period. If there's another way to tell that story that's more relevant, I would do that. But I would understand what I was departing from first. You need to understand what you're rejecting. Excuse me. I'll just turn that off. Okay, next. You need to understand what you're rejecting. Theatrical conventions, sign system. So I mean, this is, you know, that, that classic case, as I was just speaking about the notion of what are the rules of engagement with an audience. Now, we know as we move from, say, um, the 1800s into the 1900s that people started to take away the fourth wall of the theatre so that you weren't just voyeurs watching people go through dramatic moments, but those people that are having dramatic moments can turn to you and ask genuine questions to help them understand what they're going through. You start to see this, for example, in Ibsen's A Doll's House, where the character starts to talk her internal monologue, and there's no way, there's absolutely no way that a, a good director, um, knowing the conventions of the 21st century, wouldn't allow the character at that moment to transcend across the fourth wall and talk to you and say, I don't understand what's happening to me. Can you help? Um, so that is a theatrical convention. And along with that, there are different sign systems, different um, use of symbol, for example, or signs. Um, I don't want to get into semiotics here too deeply. I might later on. That come with certain periods. So uh, you would need to research that. You would un have to understand the full theatrical context 
of an extant work, particularly a period work. Language and customs. Um, hmm. Probably more appropriate for period works, you see that we're, we're or um, intercultural works, you see that we're looking at Australian works here, we're starting easy, but with challenging works nevertheless, but with cultures that are close to us, and with language that is close to us. But once again, if language and culture wasn't, you need to steep yourself in understanding that language and culture. Critical, uh, critical material, what I mean by that is um, you go back and you read, this is the fantastic thing about uh, the, the, um, the, the digital age, you can capture so much about the past. Um, it's absolutely important to read any critique that you can get on the work because invariably in there, there are clues as to what not to do. <laughs> uh, there could be a crit of a work that talks about the failure of the play itself structurally to deliver. So, so it's a critique of the play and the playwright. Or at the same time, there could be a critique of the production, the play and the production being two very different things at times. Um, the production and how it is efficient or deficient in um, telling that story you know, just things like it slowed down in the second act. Oh, my God, okay, so there's something about the second act that's going to be problematic that I'm going to have to work on uh, to invigorate and activate. It might be, it could have been in that particular production or it might be absolutely structural and endemic in the play text itself, the pretext itself. So you reading critical material is important. Well, I would. I mean, le uh, you learn from the wisdom of the tribe. There it is. Ideas, contemporary theories. I mean, you can't do Brecht without knowing something about Marxism. It's as simple as that. Or um, historical materialism. You need to know about these things to, to direct a piece of Brecht. And this is what I mean here. Invariably, um, uh, invariably plays come from a particular lens and that lens is something that is embodied by the playwright, the way they live. So if I'm doing a, a work that's overtly feminist, I've got to know what type of feminism I'm looking at, considering, as I've said, there's more than one feminism. Uh, so once again, contemporary theories and ideas uh, must be researched. You have to have a good handle on them. You need to be able to communicate those to your actors because they may not have done this research themselves. By the way, all of this research should be done by actors as well, as far as I'm concerned. Films. Listen, it's, it's great. It, you know, films and pieces of music, particularly extant films and extant pieces of music, in other words, things that exist, which is, I just said something tautological just then. Things that exist in the collective, commercial, general public consciousness need to be addressed because the amount of times I've sat in a show and watched someone throw a piece of music at a work and I've got a whole stack of other associations with that piece of music, that's problematic for me because what it does is it takes a person out of the work into their other associations. You're trying to marry a work with a piece of music, for example, but I have so many other associations, which I think, which is why I think the use of extant pieces as opposed to original pieces of music, um, you must be immensely deft uh, in using them, or else a piece of music can be ruined for you forever when it's applied to a commercial, for example. You could never use it again in a piece of theatre without the audience going, oh, that's that music from that commercial. And you think, no, at this point, I want you to be inside of the play, not thinking about that's that piece of music from that commercial. So try, if you can, to be tasteful. I know that's a, an amazing thing to say, but taste doesn't necessarily come easy. Films are important because there is a visual language or a lexicon of images that surround these plays or any play. For example, you could say, if I said to you much to do about nothing, you're either going to think about one or two things. You're either going to think about having seen it as a live production, the Kenneth Branagh production, or the most recent film production of it. And you think, okay, I've got that image in my head. 
you need to know what you're up against. You need to know the artistic landscape, the way these works have treated, been treated. That doesn't mean you're going to ruin your process. I, if, I think if you're strong enough, you can um, not necessarily reject or resist, but understand and incorporate where your vision sits within a field of other people's visions for the work um, in contemporary culture. Other productions. It's good to see other productions. It's excellent to see other productions. It's good to know what you want to do, what you love from other people's productions, and what you would never, ever do. Um, it's of great value. I'm clicking the button. I'm clicking the button. Button clicking. And now it's waking up. There it is. Sorry about that. I don't know what it's doing. Here's some research tools. Um, up to around about 1996, there was the Australian New Zealand Theatre Review. So if you're looking at an extant work and you want to do it again, go to, your, go to probably a university library and somewhere in the back of the stacks, obviously if they've got you know, drama and humanities and theatre studies um, or performance studies, there will be these you know, photocopied, daggy-bound things. It was done on the cheap, but it was an amazing compendium, these, this journal, for looking at what has been on in that particular year and how it was reviewed. Now, it's easy. You can just go online. But believe it or not, there really was a gap somewhere between 94 and, you know, probably 98 the collecting of reviews and putting them somewhere in, in a repository online um, faltered in Australian theatre research. And so there's a gap there. Um, so go here for the old stuff and just go online for the new stuff. But do your research. Arts Hub is good because Arts Hub is starting to... artshub.com.au is starting to um, develop that repository. And, of course, there's the Australian stage and all of those as well. But once again, there are a lot of people that are not necessarily very qualified to write reviews that are writing reviews. They don't have probably the breadth of critical analysis that they could bring. They have problems differentiating between the production and the play versus the acting and the directing. Um, Try to read reviews that are that have some level of credibility, which means going back and looking at who's written them, looking at several of the, the ways that they write. I'm not interested in one person's opinion when it comes to review. I'm looking. I'm interested in some type of objective analysis of the work. You can have a subjective response to it. You can say you enjoyed it, you loved it, but can you say why? Mm. Read reviews. Look at blogs. Critical Mass is one. Um, see theatre and go to festivals. You've got to broaden your aesthetic catalogue. In the back of my head, because I've got... Um, well, I don't have a fantastic memory, as you can tell. Um, but in the back of my head, I've got a great visual memory for almost every production I've ever seen. I could draw the set for you right here and now. And I could also describe a moment... Uh, from that, where they did something visual or dramatic or active. Um, it's really important. The more work you see, the, the broader your understanding of theatrical gesture and what it means is to theatricalize is important. That's Sandro Colorelli and something that I directed last year and the year before that and the year before that called Lady of the House of Love, which has had several nominations in the Groundlings and one nomination for the Matilda Awards again. Um, I'm not sure whether we'll get anything, but it's nice to be nominated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's move on. Clicking the button again. Okay, analysis. Well, what is it? It is, to it is the penetration of the text in order to fully grasp the story of the play and the manner of its telling. Isn't that great? Not just the story of the, of the play, but how it is told. What comes first, what comes second, what comes third, which is, by the way, a description of plot. Not story. Story is everything. Story is what's happened before they've even stepped on stage and what is happening whilst they're on stage. But plot is the plotting of dramatic action or dramatic events. Now, the order 
in which you plot out information to an audience is part of the manner of its telling. Does that make sense? Style is also part of the manner of its, uh, of its telling. You're looking at structure there and style. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to get into that, but, you know, that's a... Uh, Benedetti helped us with that. God bless him. What to analyse? Well, we've looked at everything. The form is really important. We use the word form a lot, and I, I think somewhere in here I'm going to actually give you a definition of form, but we use the word form a lot. I'm very interested in cross-art form work, and what's wonderful about theatre is that it's inherently cross-art form already. It involves music, it involves dance, it involves movement, it involves text, it involves singing, it involves not speaking, it involves stillness, it involves all of these things, visual image, um, filmed image. It can, it can encompass so much, so... The, the theatrical form um, is an immensely eclectic art form. And as such, pinning down what particular combination of forms this play and this world demands is important, so it needs to be analysed. Genre. Um, that's my bird in the background. Uh, genre, genre, genre. Can you see me? Um, genre is a slippery term. We're going to talk about it. But basically, if we were to talk about these two plays, I'd say one is psychological realism, heightened psycho uh, psychological realism, and the other one is a kind of um, heightened stylistic realism, both of which are contemporary. Um, and, I'm not, and I'm hoping that you know which ones I'm talking about, uh, obviously. Uh, Genre, as we start to go backward in history, becomes uh, easier to quantify, whereas um, when we start to look at the eclectic notion of theatre now, particularly contemporary theatre practice, it slips around a lot. You can have several genres explored within one play, for example, and uh, if, you, if you're not across those different languages or conventions or styles of theatre, then you don't fundamentally understand the song that you're singing or the playwright singing. I've talked about structure. Play structures are fantastic. If you look at the Hamlet, it's full of mirror scenes. In other words, there's a scene here that sets up something between two people about this theme, and then there's a, later on there's another scene that sets up either the same two people or another two people or one of those two people about the same thing but from a different angle. It's called a mirror scene. Structure is amazing. Matter of fact, structure, the way things are plotted out, why a scene is that long as opposed to that long, why a scene has text in it and why the next one has no speaking in it whatsoever, is about the structural formation of the way you plot information and release it to the audience and what language you choose choose as you vary that process along. So you need to understand the notion of structure. Why are both of these works long one actors? And we, they're not really one actors. We don't call them one actors anymore. They're, they're works within themselves that sit around about 90 minutes in duration. They're around about as long as you can sit before your bum says, I need to get up. Um, and you could question that maybe Sweet Phoebe might be a bit short. And you could question that potentially Sisters might be a bit long. It might be re-prosecuting several of its ideas. That's the dramaturg in me speaking about structure. Scenes and beats and French scenes. Well, you know, well, the scenes are really obvious, but... Scenes are very interesting because... A writer, in some respects, is trying to capture a moment, but you look at the difference between contemporary scenes that could last one or two pages, or sometimes even a page, or sometimes not even a page, and you look at the length and duration of the scenes in Sisters that actually go for quite a long time and actually get longer and longer with longer speeches and longer durations of, re of revelation. And there's something going on there. How a scene clicks through a play creates a rhythm of engagement with an audience and it's all about pace. And so never just take a scene for granted. Always look at how long it is in comparison to the next one and the one before and the one after. And that starts to reveal structure. Um, the beats, and we know that beats uh, 
we know that that is a mistranslation from Stanislavski um, about the bit. Uh, here's a bit, here's a moment. But we talk about beats now. And listen, beats are as long or as short as, as an arm or a leg, in other words, or a piece of string. We will go through and, and I will say, here's a scene, I want you to go away and break it up into beats. In other words, moments of action um, that have a kind of a beginning and a bit of an end and then there's a change and something else happens. And what you're invariably going to say to me is, is it when the actor changes their strategy or when the character changes their strategy or is it when a new piece of information is introduced? Is it when... Um, there's a silence and then they go on to a different subject. Is it when someone else um, is introduced or something happens? You know, there are so many different criteria you can, you can use for a beat or a bit. For me, it's a workable chunk. It's a workable chunk that has a sense of consistency within itself. And invariably, if I'm going to chop the beats up, it will be a, a variety of uh, criteria. And it'll be... Um, there's a pause here and then they talk for a bit and there's a pause here. I will use that criteria. Um, there's a new piece of information here and, and the other character's just finding it out and then they pause. I will use that criteria. Um, two new um, characters entered in. They have a bit of a scene, then they go. I will use that criteria. It's what you, you do to break, to eat the elephant. Have you ever heard of that idea, to eat the elephant? You can't eat an elephant, so you've got to nibble at bits. So you chop it up into little bits and you work on those bits intensely and then you try to paste them all together and see if they stick. Uh, French scenes are just simply the tracking of people coming and going. And French scenes are very, very valuable to directors, particularly with large casts, that don't want... Um, Joe blogs to be called at the beginning of the day and to sit around for the next two hours doing nothing and not getting on the floor and then finally somehow you figured out, oh, he's here, we could use him. French beats um, basically break down the entire text, as you know, into where that actor appears at any given time and an efficient director will use their human resources, their actors well, and say, I'm going to call you in for your three scenes and even though they're not sequential, we will make them sequential when we start doing stumble-throughs and runs. But for the moment, because every single one of these scenes includes you, we're just going to work with you uh, this morning. So French scenes are a very good way of working efficiently and trust me, you need to work efficiently because you don't want to piss your actors off. Pagination, pagination. You pick something up and you look at the way it sits on the page and you squint your eyes and you realise that it's all justified right to the very edge or it's basically justified on one side and not the other and you go, that's prose. And then you see it's staggered and, and then it stops short and there's half a line and there's another half a line and there's another half a line you go... That's poetry. You can tell instantly by just looking at the page what the actual style is and how it moves in and out of style if it's a sophisticated work. So pagination is very, very good, particularly if there's the very scant text and then it says pause. Very scant text and then it says pause. You know you're working on a Pinter or a Beckett. Prose and poetry style, I've just um, said that. When I was working with Bell Shakespeare, there was, uh, John had a really lovely discipline, which was he would always carry around with him, he probably doesn't have to do it anymore, a series of dictionaries. And if he would come a, up against a, a word that he didn't fully understand or did know but thought that there might be deeper and other potential meanings for it, he would look up multiple meanings for that word and see how the multiple meanings inform what he would choose as an actor. Um, and I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly um, recommend it, particularly if you're dealing with a, a technically complex or um, textually complex work. Literary allusions, intertextuality and intratextuality. I'm just going to push this next button to see, oh, look, there's something that I've directed that was full of um, a multidisciplinary hybrid performance work. Intertextuality is when uh, a text refers to another text. Um, so, for example, in The Simpsons, when they talk about 
um, Moby Dick or something like that. That's one text referring to another text. Um, intratextuality is when the text refers to itself, it folds back upon itself. You will find these two techniques used again and again and again, um, particularly in playwriting because playwriting is uh, about being a dramatist and drama, as we know, is a, um, is a construct. It's not real. It's um, compressed in time, um, brings out themes and issues through action, um, it, it elicits emotions, and it often uses intertextual and intratextual techniques to develop those ideas. So the word blue keeps coming back, but it keeps coming back in many different forms. Or a gesture um, uh, comes back, and it comes back again and again, and that gesture is intratextual. It develops deeper meaning the more it's used. Watch for those in the, in the work, because... Stephen does it a lot, very, very cleverly. He'll use the word again and again and again and again and again within a short period of time. And it just sounds like he's repeating himself, but he's not. He's telling the actor something about the notion of repetition and he's playing upon the ear of the audience with the notion of repetition. And every single time that's said, the meaning becomes more complex, more deep and more interesting as opposed to more complex, more deep, and more interesting. Yeah? Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Here's a commercial break whilst I click the button. I don't know what it is. Let's get on the same page. That's something that I directed. What is this? Tiptoe. And there's Sue Ellen looking scarred and craggy. That was... What was that? 2008? What are these? Uh, we t I've talked about them a lot, but now I don't have to talk about them as much. I place performance studies as a notion. Performance is a great big umbrella, is often placed in the centre. And then you talk about different art forms, genres, styles, theatrical conventions, and the very notion of the poetic of drama itself. So let's move on through this relatively quickly so as not to bore you. I'll do that again. Here we go, what are these? Performance, a broad umbrella term for performativity, a concept that encompasses many forms of theatre from the traditional through to the performative installation. Listen, a car can have great performance. You can have great sexual performance in, in bed. And that's what we mean by performativity. It's a large action umbrella. And under the notion of performance sits several poetics. And one of those poetics is drama, and the other poetic is post-drama. Um, we're focusing on drama at the moment. And under drama is a whole stack of different styles and genres. This is what I said, Performance Studies 101. And you might buy this word, you might not buy this word, but it's been in common use um, in universities and throughout um, the industry since the... It started in the 1960s, but it got traction in the 90s. Um, art form. An art form is, um, is a hierarchy of meaning created through a specific placement of elements. Performance, sound, lighting, text, etc. Text-based theatre, physical theatre, theatre of image. So we could say all of these are theatre, but they, they have a different emphasis towards a different particular type of theatre. So the art form has within it lots of different kind of placements. Try not to get your undies over your head about this, as my mother Nola would say, God bless her, because these, this is a muddy field. It doesn't really matter. As long as you can use words as consistently for yourself and you develop a language with actors and the other people that you're working with that's consistent, then just stay with that. If you feel that you're using the words inappropriately, investigate them, look at them. But people use these words in a very loose fashion and sometimes I like to be specific. Um, and as Umberto Eck would say, an art form is a conscious organisation of stimuli, conscious organisation, not an unconscious organisation of stimuli. In other words, not a dog's breakfast, not sweet Phoebe's breakfast, but the notion of I am plotting information, I am using very specific tools and structures to consciously organise the stimuli that we're showing to, to um, the audience. That's the art form. Moving on. Now, I talked about the open form when I was up there last time, and I need to talk about it again, and I'm going to talk about it very briefly. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because Sweet Phoebe sits very, very well within the notion of an open form work. 
What open works have in common is the artist's decision to leave the arrangement of some of their constituents either to the public or to chance, thus giving them not a single definitive but a multiplicity of possible orders of interpretation. Listen, all theatre is about interpretation. I, did I hear Jermaine Greer the other day say that all interpretation is misinterpretation, which basically means that if you're trying to interpret something invariably, you're not going to have all the information, you're going to miss out. And that's when you have to have the courage to fill in the gaps yourself. So with Sweet Phoebe, there's certain decisions to make. Did the dog ever exist? Um, what does the dog represent? Are they an infertile couple? Or is the dog rather the dog of depression or a much larger spiritual um, quest? Does the dog start as real but then become stylistic and symbolic or the reverse? So there are so many questions around the notion of openness of form. It means there's gaps in the work. The, the, the playwright has told, you, has told you only so much and has decided to tell you only so much. Some people, uh, when they look at a script and go, I don't understand it because I don't know this, this, this and this, but that is the playwright's deliberate intention to put gaps in the work so you as an audience can be active in engaging with it because a good work lasts beyond the stage. You should leave the work and say, I wonder what happened to that couple. I know exactly what happened next. This, this and this happened. And you're filling in the gaps you get to do that creatively after the event. Why not do it during? Why not come out of there and say, isn't that amazing when she did X, Y, and Z because... And someone next to you say, I didn't think that. I thought she did X, Y, and Z because of this, not that. And then all of a sudden, the work is operating on a multiplicity of interpretations and it's richer and it's deeper because it's engaged your imagination actively as opposed to passively. There was a playwright... Um, an entrepreneur, or oh, here's Godot, so it's, you know, it's the, you want the ultimate dramatic open work. We, we get two people and a tree and they repeat um, these actions again and again and again. We don't know where they've come from, we don't know where they're going, and yet it's still immensely engaging and wonderfully funny and actually immensely vulnerable, and that's because the openness demands of us to actually fill in all of those gaps. It's an immensely human act because life is full of gaps. There was a playwright and entrepreneur in the 1800s uh, called Eugenio Scribe and a uh, French um, playwright, um, could have been Belgian, and he developed the formula for the perfect play. And invariably we're talking about melodrama at this point, and melodrama isn't to be poo-pooed because in some respects melodrama had a lot of um, socially conscious, social, just, social justice issues, particularly around poverty um, and corruption. Uh, but, you know, it has its heroine, it has its hero, um, it has its villain very clearly earmarked, very clearly aligned, and then they meet and then they fall in love and da-da-da. And we look at Hollywood rom-coms today and they follow a very, very similar um, plotting device, a plotting structure. These are the works that are not open that leave nothing to the imagination, that do all of the work for you and that are immensely prescriptive. Now, they can be immensely entertaining, but I'm not necessarily thinking that they're challenging. What are these? These are muddy. Genre. So, in other words, slippery. Um, genre is often conflated with style. Uh, it is often a stylistic attribute um, uh, tribu attributed to a historical period of theatre, film, visual arts. We could say film noir is a genre or a particular narrative form, thriller, drama, tragedy, comedy. But genre, I think, sits above style. Personally, that's the, the way that I look at it. I could, I could say... Um, I'm just trying to think of one. Uh, um, an Elizabethan play... Uh, there's uh, a genre, we could say, within that there's certain different styles or sub-genres within it. So we're looking at um, Rome, um, comedies, tragedies, historical tragedies, pastoral, historical, you know, I'm just about to quote Polonius there. I'm getting tired, you can tell. Um, it's 7.20 at night, so there you go. I should be asleep by now. Style. These are, liter these are literary styles of playwriting wrapped up in sociopolitical cultural movements like naturalism, symbolism, expressionism, epic theatre, absurdism. Um, now, you can see how 
you could easily swap these two ideas around. Um, I don't care. Swap them around as much as you like or argue about them. As long as we can talk uh, on the same page, particularly about style, that's important. Um, I don't know where this quote comes from, but style is both uh, is, is the combination or the sum of form and content. Style is the sum of form and content. So in other words, the way something is structured, the very forms that it uses, and the things that it talks about when they come together create a certain style. Do lang, do lang. You like my dancing expressions? So we can look at something that is naturalistic, psychologically real, heightened, stylistic, heightened, psychological realism, da-da-da. There's all of these thin layers. And within all of those, you could say, this is a naturalistic piece that has some symbolic elements in it. This is an expressionistic piece that sometimes falls back into psychological realism because it doesn't know what it's doing. Acting style, once again, is different, but it comes from all of these things, and this is what we're trying to boil down to. We're trying to talk about the style or theatrical conventions that come with a particular genre. In other words, um, direct address is invariably something that you will see in epic theatre, but, but that's true. But now, because there is such, a, such an eclecticism in playwriting in the 21st century, we can have uh, multiple styles um, multiple theatrical conventions, all working eclectically within the one work, and we can cope with it. So what was considered epic theatre, or some people use the misnomer Brechtian theatre, epic theatre devices are actually commonplace now, immensely commonplace, um, and that's a wonderful thing. So acting styles, are we looking at psychological realism? Absolutely with the Sewell. Sewell, if you know Stephen, he is... Um, what can I say? Because I'm working with Stephen at the moment uh, at NIDA. He loves psychology. Psychology isn't a science. It's just a theory that we made up to try and figure out how our minds work and how we interact. Um, you know, you can't pin it down. Uh, it's when you start looking at the brain as opposed to the mind, which is what psychology does, you can start to make some type of empirical evidence as to the way people are thinking. But psychology is just a construct. Um, People say that it was invented, really, by Shakespeare um, when he started to look at the inner thoughts of people as opposed to the outward actions and what they said. He was much more interested in the fact that Iago says one thing and does something else, and then we fill in the gap with monologues, finding out why it is that he's doing that. The internal psychological landscape is a thing that's only really been in, uh, well created in plays you know, 420 years ago. So psychology is a particularly interesting idea, and that's what Stephen's interested in one thing. And yet heightened realism, the notion that the, the veneer that this looks real, and yet there is a series of rituals and particular stylistic gestures that happen again and again and again in Michael Gow's work, says that we're dealing with a totally different animal. Yeah, We're, t we're dealing with a totally different animal for acting, um, just as much as um, telling that story. This is, I use this picture for gestus, which is the capitalistic gestus, which is the combination of an idea and a theatrical gesture coming together to be socially critical in Breck's work, if you know anything about gestus. There you go. I departed for a second. Sorry, so well, and I'll get on track. Theatrical conventions, a way, a rule of doing things stylistically that we all agree becomes the language of the play. You can set up stylistic, um, stylistic conventions. I saw a fantastic work online recently called Love Song. It's on Digital Theatre Plus. If you want to subscribe to that, I would. Um, uh, a work that moved seamlessly between psychological realism and dance. And that dance was a kind of dance. It was movement. It was emotional. It was symbolic of the um, internal psychological landscape. Once you set up the rules of engagement within probably the first 10 minutes of, of the play with an audience, they go, ah, yep, I got it. Every so often they dance and that dancing is talking about their inner monologue, how they feel. Um, because it is so poetic, they can't say it. They have to sing it. That's so poetic, they can't say it, they have to dance it. Um, these are the conventions of engagement. The fourth wall is a convention. 
when two people can't pretend that they can't see each other, or when we put a blue light on stage and we go, oh, it's night time and yet everyone can see. These are simple theatrical conventions. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper. And of course, that's from Midsummer Night's Dream, and we're holding up a lantern, and I'm pretending to be a wall, and all of those things. Theatre is so wonderfully imaginative that, you know, a person can be an object, an object can be a person, and other things as well. Um, and I feel sorry for playwrights that don't necessarily allow their imagination to go beyond a simulation of reality, because reality is not fixed. There it is there! And we go with it. We go, OK, that person's going to represent war. They tell us it's going to represent a war. Like a good theatrical convention in the morning. What are these? Nearly their drama. Not to be confused with theatre. Theatre and drama are not necessarily synonymous. I can have something theatrical and something dramatic happening quite independently of it being a play. Drama is a construct of, of characters and time and place and locale and dramatic action. What is necessarily theatrical could be a huge ball full of helium floating in the air with um, lights shone through it. And there's nothing, there's no people involved in that. It's immensely theatrical. Um, and so theatre is a good language for drama, but they are two different things. Yeah? You've got to tease those things apart. I know you hate that. I don't care. Um, drama is defined, is defined through dramatic action. So in other words, dramatic action is something that involves characters and those characters get changed by events and those characters change each other through events. They might grow, they might decay, other things may happen. But dramatic action is something that happens inside the world of the play that pushes the events forward, um, uh, that changes things. We can have events in plays, like we can go and get an ice cream it might not necessarily be dramatic action, though, because it didn't change us other than we tasted ice cream. Do you understand? Okay. Dramatic action is hard to define, but its criteria are character, time and space, place, and dramatic tension. In other words, some conflict. In other words, something that's going to change. Got it? I think I go a little bit more into dramatic action here because I know that there'll be playwrights amongst you as well. Dramatic action translates feelings, themes and theories into action. It's about a play, it's a play about death, but what do the characters do and say that tell us that? So in what way is there action? Because we know that um, drama is about doing, not telling, um, and so therefore we need to create an event that tells us it's about death and that not, might not necessarily be someone dying. Um, the Seagull, for example, is all about death. It's about death of ideas and check off, death of hope, um, death of aspirations. The director's job is to structure dramatic action, um, and this is what Mitchell calls events. But I like to make a differentiation. You can have a whole stack of events. They may not necessarily be dramatic. So there you go. Mitchell and I depart on that. Create the scene with what is happening. Don't say, don't say, do do things. Paul Bishop's a fantastic actor, but one day I was working with him and he came up to me and he says, I've got this idea and blah, 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 and he talked and talked and talked and talked and it was great. And I understood what he was talking about, but I couldn't be bothered. And I said, do it. Get up on the floor and show me. Show me your idea in flesh and blood, in corporeal dramatic time. Does it work in real time to make sense? Um, or are you just simply talking about an intellectual abstraction? Because this is your tool, you've got to use this first as opposed to just this. Always look for actions that are externalised and not passive. Um, and I'm not talking about demonstrating here, which is something that we would talk about. I'm demonstrating that I'm, I've, you know, I'm demonstrating I'm crying. I'm actually really crying. Um, this is about the notion that dramatic action invariably involves people doing things. Yeah? So look for those and find more. What are you doing to him or her? This is a classic thing that's based in dramatic action. Um, I like talking this way to actors. Instead of saying, what is your objective? And, you know, what is your obstacle? I basically say, what are you, in most simple language, what are you doing to her? In what way do you want to change her? What do you want from her? What's the worst case scenario if you don't get what you want for her? And, of course, that leads to the notion of stakes. 
Remember, an action can be psychological action, not just physical action. I'm so pleased um, to say that because there is a series of actions that an actor can take by changing their strategy or the character changes their strategy to change another character and that is a psychological action. I can hit you and get one response or I can tease you, not without my hands but with my intentions. And I can get another response. Both of them lead to change. Both of them lead to dramatic action. I know this is 101 for some of you, but I've got to get through it. Dramatic action. Invariably, there's an action event. This is the way Mitchell looks at it. I'm going to use an example from Kid Stakes, which is the first in the trilogy by Ray Lawler. And the, in Kid Stakes, Rue and Olive, you should know the play. If you don't know the play, you should have read it by now. But Rue and Olive, 17 years before Summer of the 17th Doll, Olive holds up this Cupid doll and says to Rue, these are all the babies I will ever need. These are all the children I ever need. If you bring one of these dolls every single year, um, then these are, I will never ask you for anything more. And that is a psychological action. And she waves the doll, and the symbol is there, so it is externalised as well. And what Olive is doing, and what is Rue doing psychologically, are both parts of the dramatic action. They're choosing choices. Olive's choice is to tempt him. Come on. This is all. This is all you have to do. It's almost like a pact with the devil. And Rue is to test her. Are you sure? You sure you just want these dolls? You sure that one of these days you're not going to, you know, say, I want a baby instead? You can see how the dramatic action is the sum of choosing choices right down to what the actor does. It's not enough just to write it. The actor then has to interpret it by choosing a choice to do to the other actor. And you can see how it weaves all the way through an event through to dramatic action because they're trying to change each other. And they do. They make a pact. They literally come together and in so doing, they change each other that way. It's not one person just changing the other. It's one person changing the other and the other changing this one. They descend into a romance about the future that cannot be sustained. Actor's choice. Actor's choice. I'm nearly finished. Eesh. Or what drives the play? Dramatic action. This is a series of dramatic tensions. Most people say, oh, conflict. Conflict is the only thing that drives it. But there's a whole stack of different conflicts. I can have a conflict trying to climb a mountain. It's just me and the mountain. And my task is I've got to get to the top of the mountain. That creates a certain amount of dramatic tension. But invariably, most plays are about the relationships. I thought you were coming to this thing tonight. No, I'm not coming. I told you I wasn't coming. Tension of misunderstanding. Tension of intimacy. I'm going to tell you a secret now about David Fenton. And that's the tension of intimacy. It's the deepening of the relationship. Tension of ceremony. Invariably, there's ceremony everywhere. Even just going into a theatre has social norms that surround it. And if you get those wrong, like, we all agree to sit there and shut up whilst those people are saying stuff. And how many times have I wanted to just stand up and say, boring, or this is not real, everyone. Look, and why are those lights turning on and off? Um, but you don't do that because we are, you know, we are, you know, socially, there are norms that we go with. That's what ceremonies are about. Dilemma. Dilemma is about an external conflict. You know, there's the grandmother and the cat that are in the, that are in the river. Which one do I save? She's really, really old and I've got a special relationship with it. Matter of fact, this cat is my niece's. Which one should I save? Now, invariably... I would save the grandmother because of the sanctity of the notion of human life. But what's the bet that when I say that, some of you go, no, she's lived a good innings. You know, so that's a dilemma. And personal conflict is part of dilemma. And it's invariably about um, a, a dilemma within yourself, not externalised but internalised, the type of thing um, that gay men might experience when they're saying, um, I'm denying part of myself, I don't want to come out in public. That is a personal conflict. 
you have uh, Tension and Mystery. This is 101 playwriting, by the way, but it's also 101 analysis. If you can't figure out what the tension is operating in this scene and understand that it's a multiplicity of tensions and you can't focus down into those and articulate those for actors, then you're not doing your job. Mystery is, oh, look, we've got you know a, a treasure map. Let's find it. This is a great one. Surprise, the expected and the unexpected. The unexpected is when you're watching a movie and um, it, you know, everything's kind of rocking along and then a cat comes out from nowhere and you go, and you go oh my God, I wasn't expecting that. But probably the best tension is tension of the expected, which is we know a cat's going to come out at any moment. Don't go into that cupboard. Don't go in there. Why are you going in there, for God's sake? It's a fantastic driver. It's because we're privy. We know that the convention that's going on here dramaturgically is that of surprising the person, but not necessarily surprising us. But when it happens, we're surprised anyway, but we know it was going to happen. It's a lovely a paradox. And the real in the fiction is, is when someone brings a gun into a theatre and someone up the back thinks, I wonder if that's a real gun. Um, and that is a, an immensely powerful breaking of, of fictional conventions. Um, so you can have theatre. Okay. You can, come, you can have theatre that... Um, you can have something dramatic and you can have something uh, that is theatrical. And this is incredibly theatrical, and yet there's no drama going on here. This is, you know, one of those flash mobs. So there are multiple... And there's a tension here, which is between the real and the fiction. Are they supposed to be doing that? Are those people supposed to be lying down? Etc. Etc. Okay. What to analyse? Form, genre, structure. All of these things that I've mentioned, these are things to analyse. Look at the sim, symbology, sim, the symbol in this. Sorry, I'm very tired. Red. This is West Side Story. So all of a sudden that'll make sense instantly. Moving on. So you have to have the capacity to boil down what is the um, dramatic action that underpins a work and what are the basic themes. So you ask what is the dramatic question of Romeo and Juliet and you come up with, you start with what if, the what if, what if, and what would you say? What if um, two people that were supposed to hate each other loved each other? What if rivals loved each other? This is the central dramatic question that underpins the work. And you might think that this is a reductive exercise, but eventually you're going to have to say this to a media outlet, a poster, to an actor. You're going to have to boil the work down to some type of essential idea. Hamlet. What if, what would be the dramatic question? What if the Avenger cannot avenge? And, of course, uh, what if we become what we fear so that he enters into the cycle of violence? You can have multiple dramatic questions, but invariably you're going to have to zero down into one. Here's one for someone of the 17th doll. What if... What if we hold on to dreams too long? Um, what if we make a pact with each other that's unsustainable? What if we destroy each other by trying not to be what everyone else is? Dramatic questions are very important. We'll pick up more about this. Your analytical tools. I'm nearly finished. This is a classic way that I break down a script. You know, it's this page. Um, this is the act or the scene, act one, scene one. This is, I give it a title, but I try to make it a neutral title. You cannot call the mad scene in Hamlet the mad scene because then you just act mad in it. So you've got to say the scene where um, Ophelia needs something but can't articulate it. That is a, a neutral way of looking at the scene without judging it, without judging the characters, without judging um, what's going on, so that you can find more. And then I break it down to sets, props, costumes, lighting, music, sound, notes, special effects, all sorts of things. This is your gig. You do this as an executive on the work. And what it does is it means that you know the work intimately because you've gone through an analytical process. It gets you inside of the world of the play, but also inside of the technical world of the play. Finally, why theatre? The big questions. What does it do? We know it can entertain. We know it can teach. We know it can control. 
um, when we look back at the notion of catharsis and the way it was used to socially control um, uh, those men that invariably came to the, the Greek festivals. We know it can liberate. We look at applied performance work and we look at applied theatre or uh, the work of Augusta Boal. It can actually liberate people and give them tools to empower themselves. We know it can inspire. We know it can innovate. In other words, lift our spirits. Um, we know it can provoke, and I think it should do. We know that film, music, visual art and dance can do all of these things. And so what is it theatre can do that these things can do? If, if, all of, if, if film, music, visual arts and dance can do all of this above, what need we of theatre? And I'm going to leave you with that question because I want you to have a succinct answer for me. And finally, your homework. Read the next article by Judy Dench. It's really lovely. She talks about what it's like to be an emerging director. It's very simple. And then start this process that, that we've done on both of these plays because you're going to do a scene, directors, from both of these plays. You're going to have to be across it. Now, that's a huge amount of work, a massive amount of work. Do as much as you can within the time that you've got. But I want you to know these plays when we meet. And that process will happen progressively across the year all the way through to September and August and September. So don't freak out. Also, just if you don't know Twelfth Night very well, look it up on Wikipedia and just get across the plot because I'm going to talk about conceiving of a work, the vision of a work, and I'm going to use Twelfth Night as an example because it's a very good example, a very succinct example of a production that I did in 95. Okay, this might be the last slide, so I might be signing off. I'm sorry if I was a bit tired and I, I rambled, and this one's gone on longer than an hour. Um, but uh, grist for the mill, and there's a lot to talk about. So thank you. Stop.